This session is named Policy Landscape and Improvements to Facilitate Change. This panel brings together policy experts and industry leaders to discuss the current landscape and explore policy adaptations that can accelerate climate action. The panel will also discuss improving institutional coordination and governance mechanisms to effectively facilitate these policies. I would like to request the speakers to please come up on stage and take their seats, requesting Mr. Shahidullah Azim, Vice President of BGME and Managing Director of Classic Group, Noreen Chaudhry, Head of Labor Rights Program, Lotus Foundation, Jihan Palihena, Director, Asia Products Supply, South Asia Contour Brands, Inc., Nafi Suddaula, Director, Impress New Text Composite Textile Limited, Amreen Tabassum, Operational Process Manager, Decathlon Bangladesh, Buddhi Paranama, Director, Sustainability and Innovation, PDS Limited, Azizur Rahim Chaudhry, Managing Director, JM Fabrics, Director, New Asia Limited. And to moderate the session, I would like to request Asif Ibrahim, Director, BGME, and Vice Chairman of New Age Group of Industries to please come up on stage. Um, requesting Ms. Amreen Tabassum, Operational Process Manager, Decathlon Bangladesh Limited, to please come up on stage. Mr. Asif, handing it over to you now. Uh, thank you very much uh, to this session, which is basically to talk about the policies. Uh, we uh, can support the decarbonization, what, what's been talked about from the morning and also in some detail in the last session uh, through either policy measures such as tightening rules on boiler generator uh, efficiency matrix, lowering duty on machines that was also talked about and equipment to improve energy efficiency, then creating rules on equipment efficiency, lowering duty on renewable energy, and some of those uh, agenda items were discussed. Uh, also, a national policy on technical skill building and the elevation of technical skills among sector practitioners are also very important in this regard. Uh, here, uh, I would like to mention that uh, uh, this morning, uh, I was just before I came here, uh, a study was re revealed by one of the civil society platforms and they said that actually the, uh, uh, the incentive for the Bangladeshi RMG entrepreneurs to going green is uh, not necessarily, uh, they do it for the getting better prices, uh, but unfortunately that doesn't uh, turn into reality and they sort of do it to remain competitive. Uh, amongst, uh, you know, the competing uh, countries. So without further ado, let's go straight into the, uh, the um, uh, discussions. Uh, as the panelists were already introduced, let's not waste time on that anymore. I'm gonna go straight to Nafis, who is uh, 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 from Imprex, Impress New Tex Composite Textiles Limited. Nafis, could you share your experience and insights on the challenges and opportunities that you have encountered while transitioning to more sustainable and low carbon manufacturing processes. What policy measures could incentivize manufacturers such as yourself to invest in energy efficiency and emissions reduction initiatives? I would appreciate if you can uh, limit your deliberations to four minutes, please. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I would like to mention the opportunities first because obviously a lot of people has said these things that actually it, whenever we are talking about the low carbon and the climate change is uh, more efficient sustainable sourcing, it's all about the investments. Actually we need to change a lot of machines, we need to change a lot of process, we need to invest for the uh, solar panels, uh, uh, rainwater harvesting and a lot of things. So we need some funds. So there is a lot of funds that are available now. Actually, there's a green funding is there. Then ITCOL is coming up with a lot of funds. And also the uh, Zika, everybody is having a lot of funds. But the problem is that access to the fund. Because whoever's sitting here, actually, I think like Epic or Ananto or everybody, they, they, they have a easy access to the fund. But they are like only 10% of our manufacturing uh, numbers, in numbers actually, I'm not talking about the value. So in numbers only 10%. 
So what about the, all the SMEs? We need to convert them. But they have a very limited access to those funds to get the solar panels or rainwater harvesting or heat uh, uh, recovery thing. So there is, is the issues. And, and the other opportunity, obviously, the, with the, the customers, the, uh, that they are there, whatever the prices we are getting. Because it's not actually only manufacturer's responsibility. It's the government, all the stakeholders, the customers, government, everybody has to contribute here. So from the government, yes, they're giving us the like 10%, 2% uh, less income tax, then also other policies uh, supporting their giving. But what about the customers? Are we getting the prices? And also all the consumers, they have to have a very good purchasing practices that, okay, uh, I will pay more for the sustainable sourcing. We are not doing it. Because all the, all the customers is striving for the low prices policy. So there actually, we, I think that we need to have a big changes over there to make us actually, uh, we, we are more sustainable every day. Like everybody's talking about the, how many, how many uh, green building we have, but uh, you will be amazed that more 500 factories on the line. So it's a huge contribution we are doing as a uh, more vulnerable, most vulnerable country in the climate uh, thing that we are the most leading country to strive in the more sustainable sourcing. So that's the thing actually we're saying that, okay, uh, that more challenges are there, more challenges are there. We are really keen to uh, convert ourselves. Last time, Amir, uh, Mr. Enamul, and uh, the, uh, also the Epic guy, they said that what are the changes we are doing. Mm -hmm. So we are coming up, but whether we can sustain with these things, that is a question okay. in future. Thank you. Thank you, Nafis. Uh, uh, I'm going to go to Gihan Palihena now of Contour Brands. Gihan, you've just heard perspective of a manufacturer. Uh, as a uh, brand who's buying from Bangladesh, what do you see are the key policy areas that uh, has to evolve in, in Bangladesh to support the climate action from uh, the perspective of your company? And how can international brands such as yourselves collaborate with manufacturers and national policymakers in Bangladesh to create a conducive policy environment that supports sustainable practices and decarbonization in the industry. Four minutes, if you may, please. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think the first question about the uh, uh, areas and the policies uh, uh, in Bangladesh that which could support uh, uh, decarbonization, like uh, I, I, I have, uh, brought it down to like four points which I thought about. Uh, uh, renewable uh, energy uh, transition is uh, one of the main things uh, that uh, Bangladesh can uh, think about and then develop uh, policy and framework to promote uh, uh, installation of uh, solar power and renew renewable energy in the, uh, we have industrial zones. So, uh, we could allocate, if we can allocate space uh, in industrial zones, plus I think uh, uh, we talked about uh, rooftops, then I think one gentleman suggested about uh, his uh, observation and experience in another country, having, you know, vertical. Uh, so there are many measures that we could think and bring it to a policy, right? Uh, you know, bring it to a policy so that uh, it regulates uh, as a as a, a need uh, to operate uh, and so be be uh, e efficient in that way. Uh, green building standards, I think you know Bangladesh is leading, uh, but I think there are again there are many uh, other factories. Uh, I think the popular groups they have uh, invested a lot. Uh, they, there is a good uh, movement on the green uh, factories. But then there again, I think that there is, if you, if you make it a policy, that becomes different. Uh, if, you, if you make it a policy, like, you know, that becomes different. Uh, waste water management and recycling. So when, when I talk about waste water uh, management, uh, right now, yes, we are talking about the industry. 
Uh, but I think uh, 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 industry, we can uh, look at investing and also bringing a policy to manage waste, uh, having uh, better ETPs and all that. There is another uh, aspect of, uh, I have thought, so we as individuals as well, right? We are, we are talking, why we are talking is it's, uh, it's because of pollution, right? Uh, it's affecting the environment, uh, it's affecting our resources, the scarcity of resources and all that. As individual also, we, I think we, each and every one of us could be, uh, behave in a different way, like example, like, you know, at home, how do we like, look at uh, reducing water, right? Uh, you know, I think uh, most of the time when we wash our face, brush our teeth, probably we, we may be keeping the tap on. That's again, you know, wasting water. So uh, as individuals, as we talk about the industry in a, in a bigger way, but also as individuals, we can, uh, uh, you know, contribute and definitely uh, we are talking here today about bringing policy. So like if we, if the government and the uh, bodies who are operating in the apparel industry uh, can bring out policies for the factories to follow, that's, mm. that's the thing. And then uh, second question, I will go to the second question as, uh, uh, as, a, as, as international brands, what or oh, how, how can they help? Like, I think uh, collaboration is uh, one of the big uh, part, like, you know, advocate for sustainable uh, policies, support research and development, uh, collaborate with supply chain, and reward makers for the best practices. Like, so the rewards could be in uh, many ways. Uh, uh, so, and then, uh, educate uh, consumers as well to promote uh, sustainable uh, and, uh, you know, uh, to decarbonize. Uh, another fact which I would want to say is awareness uh, among everybody. Awareness among everybody, like, you know, simple things that, mm. okay, as a whole we can look at as an industry, but mm. as individuals, again, I, I, I can say, uh, since we are talking about mm. uh, it's pollution. Uh, awareness among uh, every factory, uh, yeah. everywhere, like, you know, in the industry, like, uh, if you have awareness programs, I think uh, that's okay. making accountable everybody. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gihan. You've covered quite broadly. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, when we summarize it, I'm going to mention some of the key points that you talked about. I'm going to now go to Noreen Chaudhary of Laudis Foundation. I hope I uh, pronounced it correctly. Uh, what are the policy frameworks and institutional coordination that uh, can ensure decarbonization promotes just transition for workers through job security and reskilling? That's the first question. And the second is, I guess you'll get two minutes for that. And collaboration among stakeholders, including workers, is essential for achieving climate resilience. And how does your foundation encourage multi-stakeholder engagement to foster dialogue and collective action on climate issues in the Bangladesh RMG industry. Two minutes each. Noreen, please. Oh God, I only get two minutes. Okay. Um, no, this is, uh, this, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. It's great to be on this panel and bringing in the voices from the private sector because I think that's the connective tissue that holds the key to solving some of these problems. In terms of context, I represent a philanthropic organization. In simple words, we are a grant giving organization and it gives us the flexibility to have a higher risk appetite than lots of traditional funders. So that's the good news. And I think it's fun to be on a panel and be moderated by Asif Pai. This is my third time, but anyway, Asif Pai is a moderator. It's always fun. Look, I'll keep it short and within three minutes. I think just transition is something that's at the heart of the transition that we're do doing, but we need to be clear on what it means and who is it just for. It's an opportunity to bring the private sector, public sector, impacted communities together to 
collectively define what good looks like, how to measure that, how to achieve that, and most importantly, something we've heard today a lot, how to finance that. I think from the Bangladesh perspective, I love bullets, so I'm gonna speak in bullets. There are a few truths about Bangladesh. The first thing, we are the second largest apparel production country in the world. The RMG center, uh, sector is the heartbeat of this industry. Second, we're the seventh most climate vulnerable country in the world. That puts us in a very interesting trajectory of balancing growth with sustained growth. The third reality is 40% of our population is under the age of 25. That's a huge demographic dividend. The fourth truth is that we're the only country in the world to have a climate prosperity plan. What does it really mean in harnessing that energy and making sure we are creating a sustainable pathway that's just in terms of making sure all voices, especially that of impacted communities and workers on whose shoulders this industry has been built. Azizur and I are both second generation exposed people in the RMG sector. Our fathers and the other earlier generation built this industry, but we need to take it a step further. What does that look like in terms of uh, achieving opportunity? From the loudest side, we see three areas where we can play a role. First, we need to bring more evidence to the table that climate and rights are very much linked. When you talk, when I talk to a climate person, they're like, yes, okay, labor rights. When I talk to a labor person, no, 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 climate is a scientific issue. We really, we need to merge the two. Many a times we see institutions, funders, implementation actors kind of having two separate divisions, one social, one's environmental. No, Bangladesh is the place that shows the impact of how climate and rights come together. The second piece, we need to equip workers to, and suppliers to both understand this threat and become real agents of change. Um, I'll do a little bit of self-promotion here. We recently supported Cornell's Global Labor Institute to do a study on what, what does rising heat and climate uh, flood level look like in major apparel production countries, including Bangladesh. We're looking at a loss a risk of $65 billion worth of assets and opportunities lost due to rising heat and um, uh, flood impacts in major apparel sourcing in countries. But the 65 billion is not just a risk, it's an opportunity. And that's where we can unleash on creating green jobs and what that looks like. Uh, Britspan did a study that in Asia alone, there is an opportunity of four trillion dollars of green jobs available. How can we socialize those opportunities? What does it look like and how can, we, how can we create those investments? And lastly, we need to make sure, and this is kind of critical, that the rules of the system, both at national and global policies, are and what how they will impact Bangladesh. There is a plethora of changes that are happening in the global level. We have the OECD sector specific guidelines, mandatory human rights due diligence, corporate sustainability due diligence dire directive. This marries environmental and social responsibility. But what does it look like in reality? We have to bring in supplier voices, worker voices, brand voices, and public sector voices. Thank you. Um, very interesting and thank you for keeping the time limit. Uh, uh, once again, you brought in some very uh, important uh, um, agenda items, uh, spe specifically about involving all the stakeholders uh, and uh, linking them with the international, uh, you know, scenario, what, what's going on, you know. Of course, you know, when you talk about LDC graduation, you talk about EBA and with the current political uh, landscape, it's a hot topic. Uh, and many others. Anyway, let's not delve into such issues. Uh, Buddhi, Bangladesh is rapidly emerging as a key player in the global textile and apparel industry. What are the key policy priorities you see Bangladesh should be looking at, both from a climate action perspective and innovation perspective? Yeah, mm. Thank you very much for the question and thank you for having me as well. Um, so I'll also try to break it down into a few key points. As for the first part of your question in terms of uh, policy on climate action, um, two key um, point, key uh, agendas I think we need to focus on. One is transparency and the other one is incentivizing. Um, I'll dive a little deeper into that. So what do I mean by transparency? So everyone touched on um, the whole point of uh, the LEED certified buildings, uh, 200 plus buildings in the country. Back when this race started, I would say that was done 
pure, based on pure necessity and to be relevant, right? So we have achieved such an amazing uh, achievement in Bangladesh. Now we need to look at how that gets incentivized for the future. Um, when I say re transparency, I mean reporting. So LEAD is a good example for that, but also someone mentioned earlier about SPTIs. Um, there's 12 com companies at the moment uh, on SPTIs from Bangladesh as a whole, and I believe only 10 of them are RMG. Um, this is again reporting. Now, the companies are already willingly doing this, and if the policy is set in place that reporting is a requirement or reporting is incentivized, more companies will step up to do it because they already have the data. They already are doing certain steps in reporting. So that, that will set a precedent of how do we tell everyone what, what great things we are doing and how much that is positively impacting the environment. So that is on transparency, creating that transparency. And then you go into incentivizing. Um, funding was a topic that was mentioned quite a lot. And obviously, the biggest concern or challenge with funding is disbursement of funds. How do you disperse funds in a systematic way? So this reporting can then direct you towards that disbursement of funds in a systematic way. If the reporting is valid, validated, if the reporting is of a certain standard, then you understand who is doing what, and then how do you incentivize them to do further. So that's on how you take transparency and then you move it to incentivizing. So that's, I believe, key policy that we can look towards improving or Im implementing um, in terms of um, you know, policy around innovation, uh, sustainability and clim climate action. As far as innovation policy goes or innovation uh, you know, uh, tasks goes, I think the key is localization. <coughs> Uh, localizing innovation is critical because there is so much that can be done in a local context. Um, one such example I want to take is recycling. I know we spoke about that a lot as well. Um, you know, a few decades ago, Bangladesh saw the opportunity to become a leader in the apparel industry, and today you have achieved that to be. We have achieved that to be the second largest ma ma RMG sector in the world. So now there is a, a demand for how do we make this industry more environmentally friendly and recycling is at top of, uh, the top of that agenda. So then bringing recycling into the ecosystem of the RMG sector and how do you promote that recycling is an example of localized innovation. Similarly, um, you know, uh, biogas or something that was, or natural gas is something that, that is being um, spoken about and how we implement that in a larger scale. You have alternatives like CBG, compressed uh, biogas, that can be, again, because it's localized innovation that you can look at, because it's regional, and you see that happening in regions in this region. Um, so these are the things I believe that, that would help with you know, localized innovation as well as overall policy in promoting uh, climate action. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Amreen uh, from Decathlon Bangladesh, you are part of the UN Fashion Charter for Climate Action, and Decathlon also is involved in the Bangladesh Policy Roundtable. What are the key priorities the Roundtable has identified, and what do you think must happen to enable the implementation? Four Thank minutes. You. When it goes to 14, you stop. Thank you so much uh, for giving me the floor. So, hello, everybody. Uh, I really feel good to be here because it's the like first time this is happening and so much like-minded people over here and everyone is talking about climate, uh, which really makes me very passionate about the topic. To answer the question specifically, from UNFCCC, I will just say that it's a multi-stakeholder initiative. It's an initiative who actually ensures the transitional plans of a factory, the trajectories of the factory, the commitments of the factory are met or not on a public manner by doing surveys with the help of CDP, that is Carbon Disclosure Project. So uh, that's that that is going on UNFCCC uh, in the low uh, carbon manufacturing group. Uh, as apart from Bangladesh, we have a group where we actually talk about what kind of policy trans transitional plans we can bring. So from that part also I'll be adding some points. So I'll just talk about what are the things that Decathlon firstly is doing in terms of um, uh, climate change for uh, meeting the requirements of local pollution that we say for, uh, for example, of factories located in a place 
what kind of local pollution that factory is actually creating in terms of uh, soil pollution, water pollution, or air pollution. For that, we are doing assessments, and our assessments are done internally. Uh, for example, I'm also myself an assessor, where I visit my factories and I do the assessments for the brand purpose. But this is to ensure that actually we are producing in a place where the local pollution is being not happened. For uh, chemical exposures, uh, we are also onboarding our factories to come and be enlisted in the ZDAC so that we actually uh, emit zero discharge of chemicals in the soil because every chemical is hazardous. At the same time, Decathlon is also a signatory of SBTI, so we do have a trajectory for our scope one, two, and three emissions, and uh, we also are doing the internal SBTI with all of our factories in Bangladesh, and we are following the trajectories each year. Are they actually meeting that CO2 emission that they are supposed to in order to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold? Um, interestingly, one of the best practices that we have today, and I'm very proud of it, that is about climate risk. So we are educating all of our collaborators to understand the why part, that why do we need climate change actions. And I remember Vidura giving the presentation at the beginning of our whole uh, organ like the, uh, the ceremony today. Uh, we all have to think in that perspective that the house is on fire. The climate has already changed. It's not a climate change anymore. Even when I'm sitting over here, I'm seeing so many lights. Even I'm also thinking and questioning myself, actually, what I'm doing in terms of energy efficiency. So this is a time where it, uh, it is actually, um, we have to act now. It's already too late. Maybe the generation where we belong, we are privileged. But the next generations will be the one who will be going under the impacts and everything. So from uh, also for the sourcing perspective, whenever we are sourcing a supplier, we are ensuring that supplier has zero coal usage in the factory. So in that's how we can actually do the fossil fuel you know, transition. So we do not have any kind of factories that are using zero like coal in, the, in terms of uh, our country. Um, I just want to highlight some of the points about the policies as this uh, segment is specifically designed for the policy. Uh, it will be interesting to have changes in our policy in terms of net metering when we talk about the solar panels because we do have a very limited space, vertical space. We do not have that much of uh, space in order to implement solar. But uh, one catch is that inside EPZ areas, we uh, produce uh, solar on Fridays also, like off days. But the net metering policy is not there. So it will be really interesting if uh, we can uh, actually have people from the policy makers over here. It's my request if we can see in that regard. And also about the PPA that was highlighted before. Uh, so PPA is one of the biggest solution that we have to bring on the table right now. Uh, without this, it will be um, like the solar implementations and everything. If we do the full feasibility and we, if we use the whole rooftop and we ensure that every factory is having solar still, out of the national grid, it will be a very insignificant percentage that we yeah. can become renewable. That's true. But if we actually talk about PPAs, uh, we can ensure more renewables okay. in our grid. So we have to think in that uh, retrospect. You. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really, I have to cut you off right now. I'm okay, sorry. Okay, I'm really sorry. I have to go to my next uh, okay. speaker. Uh, Thank you so much. Maybe when we come back, uh, when you summarize, we'll get you an op opportunity. Aziz, uh, uh, second generation entrepreneur of Bangladesh. Uh, uh, what, uh, in, the, in the context of our textile and garment industry, what do you see as the primary challenge and opportunity in terms of policy support and industry-wide improvements for climate change? A very broad question, but limited to four minutes, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Asif Bhai. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel, and it's great to be able to speak to you know, people who are receptive to the message that we are all, as a group, trying to provide that we need to be more aware of what's happening in the world, and climate is of utmost importance, and we need to um, start acting immediately. 
So without further ado, I'll start uh, talking about the actual topic. So I want to firstly appreciate all the incentives that our government and uh, you know the whole industry together has come up with and are providing to investors and entrepreneurs and industrialists to incentivize greens. So Bangladesh has 202 green factories already and many more in the pipeline as Nafiz Bhai said. And the reason for this is because it is something that we see as a necessity. It's now become kind of a minimum requirement. When anyone is building a new factory, the first thing they think about is how can I make my factory green so that I can comply with uh, the standards or the requirements to get these benefits that a green factory is supposed to get. So when we have these expectations, the number one expectation, of course, is um, to help the planet. That's definitely a big, big uh, motivating factor. But monetary benefit is very important as well. So our government has done something that's very encouraging for us, which is as a green factory, we get 2% less corporate income tax. So instead of paying 12%, we would pay 10% as a green factory. So that is definitely a big incentive. But in order to establish a green factory, there is a lot of investment that goes in which is not usually recognized by a lot of our customers. They take that Bangladesh is a place where it's, they have 202 green factories. I can pick and choose which one I want to place my order at. And this is my price. If you can meet this price, you'll get the order. If you don't meet this price, there's another green factory standing by to meet this. So this sort of mentality is putting us as entrepreneurs at a disadvantage because we do have to spend a lot more money in terms of investment when we make a green factory but then we don't get the return of that from the ultimate customer. So that's something that we are handicapped with. However, the government incentives, etc., these are very interesting for us. And low-cost loans, for example, there's the Green Transformation Fund, GTF, and then the Technological Development Fund, TDF. These are 5% interest-bearing loans, which is very difficult to get in Bangladesh and uh, in the world in this climate. So these are definitely advantages when you're investing for green that we're getting. There are a few challenges on top of that as well. There is a lot of existing factories. Bangladesh, the garment industry is you know, 45, 45, 50 years old now almost. And we have a lot of factories that have been existing for a long time who are willing to change or upgrade themselves into a green factory. So they do want to invest. We do want to invest and make our old factories green. But there, there's a big bottleneck. And one of them is that a lot of our energy goes towards, because this uh, panel is about policy making, I'll just focus a little bit on that. A lot of it goes on other policies which are not business friendly that hinder us or take our efforts towards those instead of focusing on green and uh, investing in green. For example, there's a lot of people from the government here as well. I would like to ask the audience a quick question. Does anybody know how many licenses we need to renew annually? If I could get an answer from a government person, just an idea. How many licenses we renew annually every year? Okay, because of time, I'll say it myself. It's 23 licenses that we need to renew. 23 licenses from 23 different organizations with each having 10, 15 people who have to sign off on that application. So as an investor, as someone who's planning about my factory, my concentration goes towards that goes towards getting those 23 licenses renewed so I can continue with my regular business. I would request the government, please give us a one-stop solution. Give us a submission date and a date when we can collect the approval after one month, after two months, after what, one week, whatever it may be. So we know it's given for approval. We will get it back after the approval comes through. Then another thing, we're all talking about solar power, but solar is not just the solar panels, it's a package. So along with the panels, we have inverters. We pay 37% duty on inverters. Mm -hmm. So how is that encouraging solar power when we have to pay 37% on inverters? And okay. the, there's one way to get around it, that is to package everything together. But the people who make the solar panel aren't the ones who make the inverter. So we have to buy them from two different places and we end up paying duties on Thank them. Thank you. Um, I think, I think you summarized it pretty, pretty and well. One more very quick point, Asif Bhai, if you allow me. Rajuk has recently taken over a lot more of uh, area than they used to because Rajuk was Dhaka-centric. So previously, the Union Parishad approvals that we had for our buildings, including yours in Ashulia, is now under Rajuk. So now we have to meet all the Rajuk requirements, hmm. which weren't taken into consideration when we built the building. So we are all stuck in a limbo. Thank Sorry you. about taking time. Thank you. If you want to talk about policy reform, 
reforms. I can talk for hours because this is my personal agenda that I've been fighting for the last 15 years. And I set up BUILD, Business Initiative Leading Development, 12 years ago to fight all these uh, policy agendas. Thank you very much. Now uh, to uh, uh, Shahidul Azim. Mr. Shahidul Azim is the Vice President of BGMA and from Classic Group. But before I go to him, I would like to refute uh, what has been said with all due respect by Salimullah Bhai, Salimul Haq Bhai, regarding the uh, uh, industry mistreating the workers and not paying wages. I think probably he's talking about an industry that was 30 years ago. Uh, Bangladesh RMG industry is the key driver of the economy, second largest exporter in the world. And when it comes to issues of circularity, sustainability, we lead from the front. We are not backbenchers. So with all due respect, uh, that's my comment uh, to uh, Salim Mullah Bhai. Azim uh, Bhai, BJMA plays a crucial role in advocating for policy changes and improvements in the RMG sector. Can you share some recent policy initiatives on advocacy efforts undertaken by BGMEA towards climate change? That's the first question. Second one is, looking ahead, what, are, what is the vision of BGMEA regarding the future of our industry in terms of climate actions? Uh, thank you, Asibai. Thanks, uh, my colleagues, uh, panelists. Uh, BGMEA is the apex body of the apparel manufacturing has been continuously advocating for the sustainable uh, apparel manufacturing. As a result, Ajiz was telling, he's enjoying 2% less taxes. The government offering 2% uh, less taxes for the green factories. This is a result of our advocacy, I have to tell it. At Bangladesh right now, considered as a model of green manufacturing hub, and uh, we have already have crossed 200 green factories in the meantime. We are also working with PACT since long, since 2012, for a partnership for clean air textile, which uh, made a significant positive impact in terms of water saving, energy, and chem chemical savings. Also, we have a vision by 2030, sustainable vision for uh, GHG emission of to 30%, ground water usage of 50%, and JDSC, zero discharge of hazardous chemicals. So for which we are all working to make our climate environment friendly. We are also working for that uh, uh, circularity, that is, uh, I say, uh, for the pre-consumer waste, we have already, ha always have the 400,000 tons of pre-consumer waste every year, which either using for filling the soil or burnout. Both are, ha both are hazardous for environment. So, we are working for that and uh, inviting that our development partners, our brand buyers to come forward because which is very expensive one and in Minta we have only two or three recycling hub in Bangladesh. In fact, the, our uh, individual industry, they are also working a lot. The setting up the solar uh, power in the factories and also working for that uh, decarbonization of the decarbonizing for the RMG industry. As you know that uh, green industry, they are, uh, well, I'm, I can say that uh, eco-friendly, the features all eco-friendly materials. So there's less carbon emission than the conventional factories. Those we are working, uh, Always, and it is a continuous process for us. Every day we have some new projects are coming. We are addressing with our global partners, with uh, our government, how we can make more uh, in the climate and all these environment friendly things. So BGV always proactive for such kind of things. Thank you, uh, uh, Azimbai. 
And I now have about three minutes for uh, floor uh, questions from the floor. If anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. Can you please uh, take the microphone over to the gentleman quickly, the volunteer? We don't want to lose time. Please introduce yourself and your question to any of the panelists. All right. Uh, thank you very much for introducing the main policy landscape parts. My name is Martin Verhoeft. I represent a brand, Stanley Stella. My question ties uh, panel one with this panel. So looking at the decarbonization of factories, we see there's already more than 200 LEED certified green factories. So a, a massive efficiency gains have been realized. The next step would be going further, which is additional reductions via greenifying the energy used. So what is your take on the policy needed to further enhance, for example, uh, power purchasing agreements, renewable energy certificates, um, allowing for a safe, reliable and greener electricity grid available to the factories so they can decouple from using natural gas and actually use electricity from the grid rather than having to burn natural gas to generate their own. Uh, or likewise, enjoying more biogas, biofuels, rather than having to use natural gas. So what's your take on, on policy initiatives that could actually help the energy system as a whole for Bangladesh? Thank you. Mm. Noreen, you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think... Uh, I, I think... I come, come from the PACT program, the Partnership for Clean Your Textiles program. So I think the two th truths that I hold from that program is access to information and evidence. Some of the things that, the examples that you've described, I think it needs to be socialized and, and we need to understand what's in it for me. So greater emphasis needs to be given before we start developing the policy and what the evidence of the landscape looks like. Where's this work? Is it is it feasible within the local context? What are the opportunities and what's the payback? I think I'd rather before getting a lay of the land and understanding what the opportunities are, we can't really start deciding on policy discussions. I mean, I'm giving a very honest answer from my mm -hmm. perspective. Also, the government has got specific policies for, you know, the future energy generation of the country. And there is a transition uh, for uh, shifting from uh, specific areas like Ashulia Ghazipur into special economic zones. So when we go into those special economic zones, it is the time to come up with such policies that would encourage a more greening. And you bring in the topic of the green uh, electricity and, and you know the production and avoidance of uh, fossil resources. I think those can be part of the policy discourse going forward, and it is the right time. So it's a very timely initiative. Thank you all very much, distinguished panelists. It's been, it's been a learning lesson for me, and I'm sure for the audience. And thanks to the organizers for this brilliant session. Thank you very much. Thank you to our esteemed moderator.